You know who directed the movie because I have the wine in front of me. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. How's everyone doing? Thank you. So before we begin our conversation, I think it would just be nice or good to know who's in the audience. So I'm just going to ask a few questions and you can respond with a raise of hands. So how many of you are lawyers, advocates, and the like, um, people working in film, broadcasts, um, journalists, bloggers, uh, women's rights activists? Um, yes, activists. I'm an activist as well. <laughs> My team's winning. Okay, so um, my name is Ellen Chilemba, and with me I have Karen, I have Michelle, I have Sarah, and I have Console. And um, yeah, we're going to keep the conversation, it's just going to, we're going to keep it casual and um, everyone will speak um, every now and again. Uh, I'll pose a few questions, but I do want this conversation to flow from each person. And then eventually we'll also open up the conversation to the audience. So I'll introduce myself a little bit and then everyone will shortly also introduce themselves. Um, my name is Ellen, as I mentioned. I, I'm here because I have an organization back home in my country, Malawi, where we work with young women that were forced to leave school early and are currently unemployed with little education. And basically what we do is we provide economic and education opportunities. Um, the economic opportunities that we provide include tie dyeing fabric and then eventually selling that fabric to produce school, school grants. Uh, we're a very small community-based organization, but our community is strong. We're 150 strong women that are pursuing different dreams and that's a little bit about me. So yeah, I'll take it over to you, Karen. Sure. Is this on? Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karen Namer, and I direct the Program on Sexual Violence in Conflict Zones at Physicians for Human Rights. And much of the work that we do within our program uh, focuses on training doctors, nurses, police officers, lawyers, and judges on the most effective ways of collecting and documenting and preserving forensic evidence of sexual violence to help support prosecutions of these crimes. We work primarily in East and Central Africa, and we're so grateful for all the work that you have done to help really reshape the, the legal landscape for, for international criminal law and now domestic criminal law with respect to sexual violence. Well, um, as is that, evident from the wine in front of me, um, my name is Michelle Mitchell, and I am the writer, producer, and co-director of The Uncondemned, the movie that you guys just saw. Thank you very much for being here tonight, by the way. Um, and just so you know, you are the last time we were screening this for free in New York City, because we have a theatrical distribution deal that's happening in October, yes. <laughs> and, it is, it is my great privilege. I always say that it, it doesn't matter how good the idea is. Um, if you don't have a team who's willing to help you make something, you are not going to make a film. It's just not possible. And so um, I am so happy to sit in front of you and represent my team. And I have to say that we have a board of advisors, and two of them are here tonight. And I'd love to point them out. So Kim Brizzle, Lara, where can you wait? There we go. There she is. Um, if you enjoyed the wine tonight, applaud harder, harder, because she's the reason why I had the wine. Um, and um, Lauren Anderson, who I always say is the most badass woman I know, if you ever have one phone call to make, call her. She's sitting right here. So thank you for being here. Um, and my co-executive producer, Artie Tandon, and the COO, Marie Arlo. And... This is the final night here in New York City for our Brazilian intern, Giovanka Barbosa. <laughs> so, Giovanka, you did a great job this summer, and um, your final review will be in later. <laughs> anyway, so I'm really pleased to be here tonight. And like I said, on behalf of my whole team, thank you for being here on an August night in New York City. And I'm Sarah Darashuri, and since, uh, since the time in the in the movie with my 80s hair in the 90s, as my <laughs> friend pointed out. I, uh, I've been at Human Rights Watch for about 11 or 12 years, and the first, 
uh, five years, oh no, more than that, I guess six years or so, I was in the international justice program, so continuing to work on some of these issues. And then uh, more recently, I've been working in the US program, working specifically on sexual violence issues. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with this great panel, and also Physicians for Human Rights. So the first person I met was Bill Hagelin from Physicians for Human Rights. So they played a big role in the, in the forensic work of the Rwandan Tribunal, too. So. It's on? Okay. Yes. <laughs> My name is Console Nishimwe. I'm a genocide survivor like these women. I wrote about my experience uh, of what happened to me, like what these women have talked about in the, in the, um, in the, in the documentary. So uh, my book is called Tested It to the Limit, a genocide survivor story of pain, resilience, hope, and I'm trying to be a voice for so many women who are not speaking up even now. So yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, I have to say something. <laughs> I'm so sorry. This literally <laughs> drives me crazy about Consolation. She's like, oh, hi, I wrote a book. No, she's the person. She's the first person, the first woman in Rwanda who spoke up about what the experience of Rwanda women in the genocide. She broke the path for everyone else, including the women you just saw in this film. So come on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so actually, we'll start with you, Michelle. So what drove you to create this piece, this masterpiece? Well, <laughs> thank you for calling it a masterpiece. Oh, I appreciate it's a masterpiece. that. <laughs> um, I'm mixing it down. Wait until what you see in October. It's going to be amazing. Um, so I was stuck in traffic on the 405 in LA. I don't know how many of you have ever been stuck in traffic on the 405 in Los Angeles, but it kind of sucks. And there's really nowhere to go. So you start listening to anything on the radio, and I had a rental car, so I had no CD. So I, in 2012, had a great moment of listening to a man named Todd Aiken, who was running for US Senate in Missouri, say, the <laughs> women can't get pregnant from legitimate rape because they have a way to shut down their bodies. And I was so mad, and I started screaming at my radio, which is a totally normal thing to do in LA on the freeway. <laughs> and I was, I was on my way to see my mom, by the way, so I had a lot of other stress. And <laughs> so I was like, you know what? This is, that's it, I've had it. I've had it with this issue. I'm going to take the sex out of sex crimes, and I'm gonna do a story that talks about what this really is. It's an act of power, humiliation, um, and torture. And then I was like, well, I don't wanna depress myself for the next three years, so how do I tell a story about what to do? Why don't I talk about the first time rape was prosecuted as a crime of war? But I promise you I did about seven months of research about the Yugoslav Tribunal, because that was the only thing I'd heard about. And then it was only when I was on the road with my first documentary, which is about Haiti and what happened to the money, doing major charity, and I was having a, I'm sure a surprise to you guys, I was having a glass of wine with a human rights uh, lawyer, and she said, oh, you want to do a story about Aka Yesu? And I was like, Aka what? <laughs> and then it started to just, it was like, a, I, I can only describe it to my journalism friends where we do lots of investigative work that often leads us nowhere. This was like a little path of flowers that just opened up and people were ready to talk. And uh, within probably three weeks after that first conversation, I met Sarah, who ended up to be like living down the street from me, who also really loves wine. I'm like, well, why are we not friends? So, so that's how it started. I was stuck in traffic and I got really mad. And Todd Aiken, wherever you are, I am sending you a fruit basket every year. Thank you for changing my life or leading me to this story. So Sarah, now we're in Rwanda and um, you're studying up the case. One of the things that um, was visible was that there were not that many resources to work with, starting with printing paper. <laughs> Your reactions are exciting that numerous times you do swear. <laughs> but um, so what, what kept you going? What, um, what was the inspiration for you to really just, what inspired you that this was going to happen? So, I, first of all, Michelle made it look much better than it was. It was actually <laughs> so much worse. We got there, there was not, I mean, we had to use doors as desks over garbage cans because there weren't any desks or chairs. And we just couldn't get the photographs, the that's why it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> and to get the, to the copy yeah. machine, to copy the indictments, we had to walk down to, this was before we had Unimira's offices, so we had to walk down the street 
for a, like a half a mile in the dust to get a photocopy of anything done. The phone line, I mean, it rang one time the whole time. Anyway, it was, it was just like the, the situation was, uh, it was not what I thought the UN uh, <laughs> would be like. Uh, oh yeah, and the prosecutor didn't, at the time, was an English speaker and the deputy prosecutor was a French speaker and the head of investigations was an English speaker and so none of them could communicate directly with that and that was the, the least of it. What about the car, the, the getting the a car. car? Oh, to get a car, I mean the, the whole thing, it was not set up, the UN was just not set up to have a, uh, to be a justice mechanism. So, you know, if we wanted to get a witness, we would have to suck up to the secretary of the deputy prosecutor who had access to four or five vehicles, and our whole investigation team couldn't get any. So we would have to, it would require like lots of planning and cajoling and whatever, and they would shut off the phone lines because someone didn't pay their personal phone bills, and we'd say, but we have a witness we have to get, and there would be, no. anyway, it was, it was, uh, it was not uh, an ideal uh, model of efficiency or anything, actually. But um, on the other hand, I, I went over with the idea that it would be, you know, that bringing justice for these crimes would help uh, Rwanda move past the atrocities and lead to a, a better future for the country. So I went in very idealistic. I was, um, you know, as as was seen in the film, thrilled to have an opportunity to be like a small part of this, uh, what I was sure was gonna be a, a model justice institution. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and you know, and then once you start working with survivors and, and have a sense of the enormity of the crime, you know, it's very personally, you know, even more compelling. But I definitely thought it was something that would contribute to lasting security and, and uh, sort of reconciliation in the country. I don't think now, ha I think, I'm not sure that, I'm, I'm less convinced that that's the case, actually having spent time there for, uh, for various reasons, including the nature of the genocide itself, which was so broad, it wasn't hidden from anybody, and it involved so many people, and the tribunal only brought a small percentage of people to justice, and very, very small, and so, so many people were affected. It didn't get both, it, it didn't cover, the entire scope of what it needed to cover to be perceived as impartial and fair, and um, and it was just a. I mean, it was just a. There are some reasons why it, it was harder. We didn't have outreach mastered. I mean, as a new, as a new mechanism, there were a lot of things that that the tribunal was learning as we went along, and so I think that there were things that, you know, are have been improving, and other, you know, as time goes on, and other justice mechanisms. But, uh, but I, I had hoped for, I guess a more positive impact in Rwanda itself than. Were there other cases that you were drawing from in the moment, so just ju during the trials as well? Okay. Oh, so there wasn't, I mean, this was, there wasn't, you mean precedent? Or other cases um, that other I was cases working on? That, that other people were working on that you, you were just trying to see how other people are moving around the sector? So, not so much. I mean, that was one of the things that, that was so interesting about the case was that it, because it was a first trial, we didn't have any examples to draw from, and the Yugoslav Tribunal hadn't tried genocide yet. Um, and so we were, kind of, we were kind of winging it, and we didn't have access to the internet. And so we couldn't, and we had, a, like, we had the Rwandan law book. We had, you know, a couple of basic texts, but we didn't have much except for, so it was sort of like, it was common sense. You know, so when they said, oh, how do we interview a suspect? It was like, oh, well, we record it. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't, there wasn't anything, I mean, on the other hand, it, it was an interesting opportunity as a new lawyer. But, uh, but on the other hand, there was nothing that could be done that was wrong because there, there was no prior practice in place. So what we were hoping was that we would set some you know, sensible things that, that were fair and, and, uh, and worked that would be used later on. Well, so they, you tell stories, you tell your life stories, um, you interact with other people. What is your reaction watching the uncondemned and the women tell their stories? Um, I love to 
really thank you so much, really, for all the work you've done. And really, um, for me as a survivor, it really meant a lot because I've never heard <laughs> anyone else who has really um, worked hard, even even within a country yet, to prosecute um, rape yet. So for me to see that really meant a lot to me. And having these women and giving them a platform to speak for so many women who are not speaking yet, I uh, really, I was young for, for me to even follow what was happening in the tribunal. But when I learned through uh, the media and what you've done, and then with the film, uh, really uh, for Michelle, for making sure the world know this, um, this case, really for me, it's, it's meaningful. It, it speaks for so many women around the world who go through uh, these horrible acts. For me, as someone who went through that during the genocide, um, when I started telling my story, it was not very easy. I didn't know where to begin and even how to tell my own story because I was 14 years old during the genocide. And at that time, living in the area you mentioned, Kibuye, that's where I was born and grew up, so many people were murdered. So, and hiding there was not very easy as you followed what happened at that time. And, um, and during that time, uh, like so many other, like these women, and uh, I was raped. And uh, for me, after that happened to me, losing my three brothers who were slaughtered and, thro and threw their bodies in, in our destroyed home, and my father was killed, so many of my family members, my grandparents, and my aunts, and so many people, um, and surviving with my mom, who saw right after it happened to me, she saw um, how I looked. And for her, as a mother, it was not very easy to see me. And having the trauma of seeing herself having that trauma, and she carried that trauma I had within myself too. So both of us, it was not very easy. For me at that time, I didn't know I was going to talk about my experience until I came in this country having to get the access to the, um, the, the, the treatment uh, because I was contracted, I contracted HIV as a result of rape, and um, having access to therapy and being able to talk about um, the things I carried within myself so many years, it was not very easy, but I came to a place where I felt um, I needed to be a voice for these women, for those women I know, some of, of my friends. I have friends who will never be able to tell publicly what happened to them. Mm -hmm. I have friends of mine whose mothers were raped in front of them. And as soon as I spoke about it and I was able to write it in my book, it was uh, a therapy for me at the same time, I felt like I'm being a voice for these uh, survivors who kept encouraging me too. And they kept encouraging me, keep being our voice. And seeing these women um, along with me, so I feel encouraged more to keep going out there and talk about it because this is happening all over the world. and. Um, and this crime is a horrible crime. It leaves a deep scar within yourself. You can't find words to describe the pain you feel within yourself. Um, but at least when we talk about it, we can get some justice, even though you may not get the, 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 uh, you know, the healing you need within yourself. At least there is a justice out there for, for survivors. So for me, that's one of the main reasons I don't keep quiet. I will keep talking about it um, and encourage other survivors so that this horrible act stop. Um, and for us survivors, we should not keep, should be the ones to carry the shame. Those who have done it should be the ones to carry that shame for the rest of their lives. Thank you. So 
In your work with physicians for human, for human rights, one thing that you do highlight is that um, response is always one thing that is behind in terms of cases of sexual assault. Um, what are some of the areas where you feel that we could advance in terms of response and what groups need to be, to be pushed to be better responders in such situations? Um, so I, I just want to actually begin my answer by saying it's such a privilege uh, to be on, on this panel with all of you. Um, and to thank you so much, Michelle, for bringing these stories um, to, to, to view and with so much humanity. One, one of the things that we work on at, at Physicians for Human Rights is we recognize, thanks to the work of Akayasu and, and to the team, to the survivors who so bravely came forward, to the prosecution team that, that masterminded this case and, 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 and managed to usher in this victory, what, what it did, as, as the film so, so aptly showed, is that it really did transform the legal landscape at the international criminal law level. And so now we have the International Criminal Court that is the most comprehensive articulation of the laws addressing sexual violence right now. And the challenge for us is that the laws at the international level and slowly um, more and more even at the domestic level for those who are in using the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court domestically, that the laws may even be improving at the domestic level. The big challenge that we see all the time is that there is a real challenge in enforcing those laws. So the work that we're doing at the national level, at the grassroots level, is working so closely with the first responders, the very first people that a survivor can can have contact with, whether it's a doctor, a nurse, a police officer, even in some cases an administrative chief or a local um, person of a, a, a privileged status. And we try to sensitize them on how to even work with a survivor and recognize exactly that, that the shame is not theirs. It belongs with the perpetrator. And how can we all together, working as a team, as a peer support system for the survivor, better support the survivor by, by referring him or her or them to, to the services that may exist in their communities, and more specifically, how each first responder and stakeholder in the justice process really understands that they personally have a role to work with the survivor with respect and with dignity. Mm -hmm. And what's more is they must work with each other to better support the survivor at the center of this process. So through our trainings, we train the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the police officers, the lawyers, and the judges very, very much consistently with the Pruitt memo, um, how, to, how to treat the survivor with dignity, with respect, how to ask questions that may not be so directed, that don't have, that are not judgmental, but that try to draw out the story. Because one of the other challenges is that when a survivor dares to come forward, and so many don't, but for those who do dare to come forward, what a shame if the evidence is not adequately documented to support their allegations. So we are really working so hard to seize that opportunity and to train these first responders to, to really use those moments where a survivor is daring to come forward to ask those comprehensive questions and document those findings, whether it's physical, psychological, evidence from the crime scene, et cetera, to document those findings so comprehensively so that when the case could be made in court, it's so compelling and, and, and there's a better chance for success. Sarah, during the research, were you able to come across any kinds of um, practitioners that were trained in that sense to be able to present them as witnesses? So, I would say there was not much training. I mean, I think there were, <laughs> that was one of the big 
uh, I think, learning experiences for the tribunal is we had, I mean, we had Patricia, who was great, who came down and talked to people. But in terms of sensitivity to sexual assaults, there wasn't really much understanding. People would ask, were you raped? And our response, I mean, initially, when Human Rights Watch told me that they had found evidence of sexual assault in Taba, extensive evidence of sexual assault, you know, we, it was, I was really surprised that it hadn't come up, that our investigators hadn't found it. And we had, you know, some sort of Scandinavian guys who were very blunt, and we had male interpreters, and we thought, well, maybe their approach wasn't good. And so the process, the uh, investigative unit sent out a team of women. But the problem was the same thing, actually. They also were, were you raped? They sent out an African woman who hadn't been trained at all. And I think, uh, I've met the person she's talking about who's a wonderful person, but literally but she said, she goes, were, were, so, were you raped? I'm like, that's your first question? Sorry, I'm like, that's yeah. your first question, really? Yeah, but yeah. it was just, a, great, it was a different just time, just but it was. Not aware. And I think yeah. also, I mean, now since I work on these issues and I, uh, you know, even though I had trained it and worked at a rape crisis center, I have a greater understanding to now, I think, of just the biology of trauma and the effects of it on people's memory and how you approach people and interview people and, and actually the importance of a gatekeeper like go to leave in establishing a relationship of trust with the community. That was so, so, so important. Um, but the other thing is, just following up on your comments, is in the work I do in the United States, it's absolutely, you know, I'm sure over the years you've read about the rape kit backlogs, you know, and it's the exact same thing. It's a shame. It makes such a huge difference how people respond to sexual assault victims when they come forward. And the, the chances of having post-traumatic stress disorder or serious trauma goes up exponentially if the law enforcement responds badly, if the nurse responds badly, if the first person that they come to says, well, why were you drinking? Why, you know, it, it blames them. There's so much misunderstanding about sexual assault still, and it has such a devastating effect on survivors. And so much of what the work that we've been doing in the US program at Human Rights Watch over the past few years has been getting police to respond, to take those rape kits. I mean, I, w I was shocked to find out that people would go through the trouble, that people would be brave enough to come forward, go through a horrific four hour, you know, physical, intimate exam after being traumatized in the, you know, in the middle of a crisis, and then that the police would just chuck the, the kits aside. And what that shows is that a lot of police would decide on the spot it wasn't a good case, so that it wasn't even worth taking to the lab, and they wouldn't even do an investigation. And that was something that we've been working on covering, and then on military sexual, anyway, but this is like a whole... Another thing, it's but anyway, let's just say at any level, at any level, it's it's, endemic. it's not just yeah. something that is in Africa and other places where that it's it's something that is everywhere, and it's uh, and it is a huge important thing for people to understand, and it's been a great change in the United States to have survivor-led advocacy where people are coming forward using their names uh, and saying, you know, the shame is not with me exactly as as you say, and I think that's the biggest shift right now, and in, in these cases, but anyway, the problem is broader than that. <laughs> so, um, not that this is similar in any sense, but one thing that Consolé mentioned was in telling the story, the difficult part is also even thinking of where to begin yeah. and where to go with it. And for, for you, Michelle, um, I know that from what I understand, there was no production crew for this piece. And where, where, how, how did you decide how you were going to start, how you were going to craft this piece, and also what, what did you envision to come out of this documentary feature? Well, wow, that's a, Sorry. I'm gonna try to <laughs> truncate it because I'm sure people have questions, but, um, so, uh, look, we, Nick, my, my co-director and I, had a great um, advantage going into this. We just won a really big award. We just won the Murrah Award. We actually beat 60 Minutes Bin Laden Special by doing an investigation into the aid industrial complex and busting the American Red Cross, who also should get a fruit basket from me every year for giving my career. Um, so, we, so people knew us, and I came to him and I was like, we have to do this story. And he's like, what are you talking about? I want to go and do narrative films. I want to do real movies. And so I, as I started to research this story, um, I kept coming to him, I met this amazing person, Sarah Darshuri. He goes, I don't care. Oh, no, I met this <laughs> another amazing person, Pierre Prosper. He's incredible. I don't care. And then I, but he did start to care because I started to tell him more about it. And, and, and Nick intrinsically was into this story. He's has, had two sisters and uh, an enormous sensitivity to uh, 
this this weird imbalance of the fact that this wasn't taken as seriously as any, any other crime of war. I had been to the IDP camps. I had been in post-conflict situations. I had actually personally seen a lot of the effects of what this meant. But then when I met the women the first time and I, I cashed my frequent flyer miles and I flew off to uh, Africa and I met them and I came back and I was like, it's on, we have to do this. And the moment for, for me, that there were so many moments where it was a driving force, um, the fact that they trusted us with their story. There's so much that you didn't see on, in this film because I didn't shoot it. Um, a lot of stuff that goes into making this means that um, I went out there and went to places that I, I didn't really ever want to go and probably could have gone my whole life without knowing that things like this existed and people did things to each other like this. But I remember looking at this group of, of um, women um, not in Rwanda, in Congo, and I remember telling them, I promise you, I am going to find a way to make sure that people understand what this is. I'm not going to tell them, I'm going to show them. And I'm not going to make people disgusted. I'm not going to repel them. I'm going to make them think, I'm going to make them understand that there is a possibility to change this because there really and truly is. You know, of all the things that go horribly wrong, and you guys are hearing a lot of it right now, and I, I personally have been watching a lot of cat videos on YouTube to make myself feel better. So I used to be a political reporter. I'm like, I can't take this anymore. But um, the fact is, is that we do get it right. We do get it right once in a while. And when we do, we have to build on that. And so what Nick and I set out to do was to tell a story that should hopefully inspire and empower and make you walk out of here thinking, fuck yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but fuck yeah, we got it right. We can do this again. It's possible. And that's what we set out to do. And I actually, um, I have an active death threat against me um, in uh, Congo with that uh, show you saw at the end, so I'm not supposed to go back, but I, I'm definitely going back because I want to see those women again that I met, and I want to say, I, t I found that story. I'm pretty sure we told it the way. I'm pretty sure the world is going to hear your voice. So that's what we set out to do. And as you know from watching the credits, you know that Nick didn't survive to see this moment. He um, turned in the film at the Hamptons Film Festival where we had won um, a big award, and texted me to let me know he had dropped it off and the film wasn't finished and he said I'm proud of this film I'm proud of us and then he died three hours later in a single car accident he crashed into a tree at the age of 34 and once I got out of the shock of losing my partner um, I was like oh my god I have to finish this movie and I remember crying going how am I going to do this I don't know how to do what's left to do and I'm all alone and I remember a friend of mine saying Michelle you are not going to be alone. Everyone is going to help you. And so I want you all to know in this room, everybody did help me finish. And we're about to go into the final mix. Um, and it's, a, you know, like I said, it's a privilege to be able to sit up here and say we have a theatrical release. It's a national theatrical release. And we have all these premiere galas scheduled around the world. And everybody helped us finish. And so I personally would love to say I didn't envision this being the finish of the film. Honestly, I thought he would be sitting right next to me. I know Sarah thought that he'd be sitting right with us. Consoli met him. We all thought that he would be sitting right with us. But in a way, he is because um, we finished the film. So, so thank you to so many of the people who were in this room. It wouldn't have happened to us. So before we open it up to the audience, um, I would like to see if you maybe have a question for each other. <laughs> you didn't see that. Wow. <laughs> um, this is the time. Sure, I always have a question. Um, the journalist always does. Actually, my question is for Karen. I'm just wondering, because I get asked all the time, literally all the time, about what's going on with the Yazidi women. And is it possible to prosecute them at the level of the ICC? So what, are you aware of any um, efforts on the level of the first responders to collect the evidence? It's a great question. So, okay. um, so we... <laughs> Two the, degrees in journalism. Yeah. Right, so <laughs> um, and, and actually, as it happens, uh, this is an issue that we're, we're also involved with. Some, one of the biggest challenges is documenting crimes of sexual violence, or frankly, any crimes, in an active war zone. Um, and so that's a huge challenge with respect to 
um, areas in Iraq. In northern Iraq, some of it is a bit quieter, but it's still, um, it's still a huge challenge, especially when people are fleeing. And then what justice system are you working with? Um, so in a way, um, some of the systems that we're working with in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, right next door to Rwanda, in a way, I mean, it's a country with its own uh, slew of challenges um, on every level. Um, but there's a stable enough system that we can work with the justice process there, with the military justice, with civilian justice, with all of its warts and wrinkles. There are people that we can work with. In, in contexts where there is a hot war, where people are fleeing, where the, um, the authorities in certain regions like ISIS um, are not people who are going to, to care about a justice process. It makes documenting these crimes and advancing these cases very difficult. However, the work that we are doing at Physicians for Human Rights is trying as best we can to work with the people who may have contact with these survivors and to help them have the tools, the skills, to be able to document these crimes when they do connect with these women and with many of the survivors from these active war areas and to be able to document these crimes so that when the time comes uh, and there's a, a, a justice mechanism that may be able to step in and address these these crimes, there will be documentation there that they can use to, to put these cases forward. One of the biggest challenges is if you don't do this documentation and a justice process actually does materialize in a few years, uh, there won't be adequate evidence to support these allegations. So the time is now to be documenting these crimes so that when as hopefully there is a justice mechanism that can step in, there will be ample evidence to support these allegations. Do we have any questions? Oh, I was, uh, I was uh, close to tears from very shortly in the film, very, very, almost the beginning of the film until this very moment, and it's um, had a profound effect on me. Thank you all very much. Um, in the film, uh, one of the, the statements that impressed me deeply is, is uh, the statement that the survivors um, want justice, not revenge. Earlier in the film, uh, there is a very clear statement that the courts are dealing with the law, not necessarily with justice. <laughs> Has this case made a difference in that, do you think? Or how, in the future, do we get the courts to deal with the issues of justice rather than with the issues of the law? That's one question. The second question is, with regard to Rwanda, um, there's another film that I admire very much called My Neighbor, My Killer by Anne Agion. And it chronicles the reconciliation uh, discussions, mandated reconciliation discussions, in which people who were victims of the genocide are formally forgiving uh, their rapists, the murderers of their husbands, brothers, and they're trying to reconcile because the country can't move forward at all until there is some form of agreement. How has um, this uh, court procedure on an international level affected that reconciliation process? Or how is it related to that reconciliation process? I think both parts of your questions are best answered by Sarah and by Console. So. Okay, so on the first part of your question, uh, I think the key is really to have laws be closely aligned to what perceptions of justice are, because you can't have judges with their own perceptions of justice or biases. I mean, they really are obligated to adhere to the law. So what you want to have is the best possible laws. Um, and I think that there is an effort to evolve, you know, with each, you know, especially with the ICC statute, there was a lot of discussion and, and uh, debate over what the, what the best 
possible statutes would be for defining these crimes, and uh, and and they re they revisit that every uh, periodically to see, make sure it's it's in good shape. The International justice will always only capture a very small portion of perpetrators, so complementary mechanisms are really important. So national prosecution mechanisms are very important. But in some communities uh, where there is a strong cultural um, history already of reconciliation mechanisms, there can be very useful community-based healing processes. But there are also limitations to those in some circumstances. So, for example, for really serious crimes, uh, it's very hard to have community groups just have it be accepted and not, uh, you know, with just some apologies or labor if that person killed your family or raped your family or whatever. It's very hard uh, to do that. Then there are also, there are sometimes concerns about the rights of the accused too because people sometimes can abuse those processes. I mean, there are a lot of stories about people pointing the finger at someone who they had a personal dispute with over their land or something else. Um, then uh, there are other issues as well with respect to perceptions of fairness. And, and uh, I mean, actually, while I was in, in terms of what crimes are selected, who is chosen for prosecution. So there are a number of things that can impact how effective the gachacha or community-based uh, reconciliation measures are, and it, and it can depend a lot on, on different things. And in fact, um, Mozambique was very successful in part because there were the in doing mechanisms like this. In fact, one of the most successful places. But it was partially because people they had a really strong community uh, program that already did sort of reconciliation things, and also. Uh, it was the split was not ethnically based. It was within one's own family. You could have people from opposition parties, and so there was a stronger incentive for people to want to come together after. Um, and so there are certain factors that can make those mechanisms more successful in some places than others. In Rwanda, I mean, it was interesting. It's very hard to talk in Rwanda now because there's not uh, there's freedom of speech is a little bit circumscribed by. Um, the current regime, but the but I did have a chat with someone when I was there, who told me that he was forced to, uh, you know, forgive the people who killed his parents, and how uncomfortable he was with that situation, and how his child, you know, now those people want the, to play their children to play with his children, and how painful that is. So I think it's an, a bit of an open question as to how you know, ultimately that will happen. And there are a lot of different factors. Uh, and unfortunately, I wrote a report on this and so <laughs> that no one read <laughs> for Human Rights Watch. So I could talk about this for far, far, far too long. <laughs> so I will cut myself off. <laughs> but but constantly, I mean, what, about, what happened with your family? With, um, of course, the people who have committed the crimes for my family, uh, myself, I faced somebody who did horrible acts to me of rape um, in the prison. But then I came, I was young at that time and I didn't even know how to even express in words, you know, uh, in front of him. It was so scary for me to even face him at that time. And, um, and then when I came here, uh, that's what, when I learned he passed away because HIV and you know AIDS he had and and passed on and, and you know and it was very hard for me and my mother of course she lives where next neighbor you know to the people who have done horrible things to us and I, I've learned um, what my mom had told me that for me to be able to move on with my life I should not carry any anger or hatred within me so for her. She had to go back to school and teach some of the kids of the people who have done horrible things to us during the genocide. So, and for me to see her, you know, doing that, I've learned that for me to have a better life, uh, of course we should have justice, but I should not have to have the, the hatred they had in order for me to, um, to have a healthy and fulfilling life. 
I should not carry any anger or hatred within me. Of course, it took me a long time to be able to get to that stage. But uh, for so many survivors, you had no choice. Because these people live next to you. So you had no, no choice. These are the people you're going to meet in the market. You're going to share. You're going to the same school, to the same you know, church. Um, for you to have, to be able to, to have some sort of a kind of normal life like you had before, you had to find a way to have that peace within yourself. So, uh, and for so many perpetrators, they've never came forward to ask for forgiveness to us. So for so many survivors, it's like for them to, to do that, but uh, for perpetrators, most of them have done that because they knew some of them forever, how long they've been in prison, they might be released and go back to do community service and live back in the community. And for the country, they had no choice of finding a way to make people live together. That's the only way they can, they can do that. And, and of course, for survivors, it's a, for us, we always have this, you know, pain and some of us are taking a long time to heal because there are perpetrators who still have that showing that if they get a chance they can do the same thing they have done. You can tell because there are survivors that right after testifying in the court in the Chacha court, Gachacha courts, who were immediately killed. There are some uh, articles showing that some survivors have been killed or, you know years before right out when the gachacha quarter was happening at that time. So this is, um, for survivors, it will take many years. For us to be able to, to live our lives, we have to find some, some, something to help us live well. So um, at least have some, you know, because we, have, we need to have the peace within ourselves. So for the perpetrators, we, we are not looking for, uh, at, at least for them to, few of them have been, came forward to ask for forgiveness. Uh, someone who killed my, bro my brother, who was a neighbor for my family for so many years, he was able to write a letter to my mom, you know, how he feels, what he's done, and he feels so bad for what he's done. I, I actually put the letter in my book and and try to translate it, but I put in, the, for those who can read Kenya Rwanda can see exactly the way he wrote the letter. So uh, not everybody was the same like what he did. For me and my mom, we, we had to talk about it and she ha we had to make sure that we are not having any hatred towards this person. And, and it's something that we had to talk about it you know, gradually and be able to, to see that we, we are still alive. We need to, to live for others. And for me, I think me and my mom were so fortunate to be alive because not so many survivors who have a parent because I have survivors who've lost everybody. And they have all these painful memories they carry within themselves. At least for me, I went on my mom's shoulder and cried on her shoulder whenever I needed the time to cry. There are widows who live by themselves. And this, in our culture, we don't have a system of nursing homes. These are, they are getting to a point where now they are alone, just having the griefs on their own, in their homes, and no one to, to talk to because their, their kids were all killed and, and their husbands. And some of the, 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 widow, the, 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 the women who have children from rape, the, the trauma of a child was born from rape and the mother, because she doesn't know how to talk with this kid. And these are the, something that I want also for us to discuss about um, the trauma of a child who was born from rape, because she's going to hear, or he is going to hear, some, his father was um, a killer, he raped his mother, that's how she was born, he was born. And the mother has a trauma, and, and, and at the same time, they, there are some of them who have physical disabilities from rape, like you saw on, on, on the screen, how they were tortured physically. I'm one of the fortunate ones, that's why I speak, because I can walk, I, am fun I can function physically, mentally, at least I can, I, I can sleep and I can do things. So, 
there are, I have, I know a friend, she's, her name is Mary, that's I can give you her name. So it's someone who has been in bed for more than 22 years because she can't function physically. Her body was completely destroyed during the genocide. She's in bed, but she finds a way to, to have a smile on her face. When she sees you, it's almost like when she hears my story, she's also, she, she feels bad for me. But I always look at her and as someone who find a way to have the joy despite the, 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 the pain she's having all the time physically. That's an example I'm giving you of one person. There are so many. Those who live with HIV, like myself, and in, when we take medication, it reminds us what happened to us. <laughs> and it's not very easy because it's like a reminder of what she went through. But for me, uh, in order for me to be able to move on with my life, I found a way to look at my medication as, as like a vitamin because I want to be able to function, uh, be able to function mentally and be able to do the things I'm doing to be a voice for these women. And, um, and I think um, uh, for, for us, for, for, for so many people, it's so important to talk about, there, there are so many things to talk about with, about these survivors. There are so many great things to happen in the country, but for survivors, we need to keep having the platform to be able to express those um, those things we have, uh, because all of us have different ways of coping with what happened to us. So I think that's all I can say. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add something really fast that um, what Consley just told you, um, you can't other this. You can't say, oh, it happened once upon a time in Rwanda. Um, I hear these stories all the time. Ever since we've, we crowdfunded this film, we're still crowdfunding this film. So we've been crowdfunding since October 2013. And I get emails and phone calls and text messages from all around the world. And it's all the same. And it's not women and girls all the time. It's men, it's boys, it's every region, it's every religion. And the thing that literally stops me every day is what is wrong with people? And why are we talking about this? I know it's really not the most comfortable thing, but seriously, Donald Trump's not the most comfortable thing either, right? And we have to talk about some of these things. We have to start talking about what is happening out there in war zones and what does conflict mean? Conflict means civilians pay a disproportionate price. That's reality. So we have to start dealing with this. It's not boots on the ground, some glamorous like Ernest Hemingway parachuting and having a whiskey and then saying, ah, I shot a Spaniard today or whatever it was, you know? That doesn't exist. It's these terrible, terrible stories where people have gotten away with this. And the minute that people like Consolé become the majority where they stand up and say who they are, what their name is, and like, you know what? I'm not gonna let taking my medication every day be a moment of defeat and make me die of sadness. Like you heard in the film, that was the intent of the perpetrators. She's gonna turn this into a moment of empowerment of guess what? I'm gonna swallow these pills every day as a I'm still here, ha ha ha, and I have a voice. And the minute that we actually start talking about this and take away the stigma and the power of this, it's actually going to stop. This is not a naive thing. I'm not telling you we're ever gonna eradicate this. I don't think that's possible. But I do think it's very, very possible to mess with the minds of these perpetrators who think that they're gonna get away with it. Now we have to take it as seriously as any other war crime. We have to stand up for the people like Consulé who come forward um, and understand. I mean, I personally have seen victims as young as three. Uh, I've heard of victims as young as three months, and I've met victims as old as 93, and that's both genders. So this is everybody. It can't be othered. It's every region, it's every gender, it's every age, it's every religion, and we have to solve this together. We've run out of time, but sorry, <laughs> the last word. No, there's, there wouldn't have been enough time. But our panelists are around, so you can catch them if you have further questions to follow up. And then 
Uh, before we close, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you for being here. And Michelle, thank you for sharing this story and creating this platform so other people can learn more about the Rwandan genocide and especially victims of sexual assault. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for opening up and just really sharing with the audience and with me as well. But um, yeah, so thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. the Ham Hampton International Film Festival. So thank you. Go, thank you. it's fabulous. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.